to uh, slush this, this reading because we left with very little time. Um, Sorry? Can you tell us a little bit about the book before you start reading it? Yeah. Um. Okay. Is this on? Is it on? All right. Um. Okay, I'd originally um, prepared a, call it a narrative quilt, if you like, um, of uh, the author's note, uh, the introduction, and, and, and some select chapters uh, in the book for tonight um, that deal with, uh, with South Africa, specifically the book uh, is not a South African book. It's not focused on South Africa. Um, in its various form, it uh, is a narrative history of the goat doctrine, um, its origins in the American military industrial complex uh, in the early 1940s, and um, its growth and evolution in the rest of the world. Um, the main departure point of the book is is uh, the goat doctrine in or from an African perspective. So essentially, it explores uh, outside of the in sort of usual colonial tropes how uh, the goat doctrine came to be midwifed um, in the African context. So it's or, or it's an alternative history in a sense. Um, or parallel history to some of the official periodization, um, the, the kind of well-known milestones um, of, of colonialism and imperialism um, in Africa. What I, I think I'll do is, is just read essentially a quarter of what um, I had planned to read and then um, I'll discuss very briefly. Um, I'll discuss very briefly my interpretation of uh, the present crisis in South Africa, and um, something of the lens through which I see this crisis, which is adjusted from the book, and um, some discussion points on. Um, possible prospects based on the current trajectory, um, policy trajectory of government, and, uh, and then finally I'll conclude with um, I try to stay away from the word solutions, but uh, let's, let's, just, let's just say uh, I'll try to address the question, question what is to be done. Okay. Um, all right. Without further ado, let me get started. Um, this is taken from my author's note and, and introduction mainly, and then um, from the uh, one of the concluding chapters in the book. There is a colorless jargon term called externalities that private corporations routinely use. In the age of footloose capitalism, it is among the most openly ideological yet enduring facades since the, se the Second World War of what has become known rather prosaically as the growth economy. In the day-to-day -day media, this is the smoke and mirrors of the wealthy and powerful. The social impact of growth is censored and unreported. The media barons who sit at the choke points of propaganda, wrote the Australian journalist John Pulger, regard this cavalierly as slow news. The reality is less mundane. The term is a current euphemism for what the historian Elizabeth Smith, in her eloquent defiance, has described as corporate camouflage. 
it masks the daily deluge of social and environmental imbalances. By this form of legal plunder, it offers not prosperity for the majority, but simply a hidden reality. It is the strategy of ruling elites and their agents. Edwin Herman had written in his fine essay, The Banality of Evil, to normalize the unthinkable for the general public. It is March 2021, around the time that the COVID pandemic is cutting a ruinous sway across the world. And I'm sitting in my study, trying to draw a, li a, a line under the past that is not creeping into the future. It all seems like the received verities of imperial carnage that was the post-Second World War growth miracle are suddenly being swept away only to be replaced by another dystopia. All around me, the human, social, and environmental costs of close to a century of growth are being seared in public consciousness. Indelible images of death and desperation, the devastating impoverishment of at least a quarter of the global population are not confounded. They betray a generalized systemic crisis that is becoming in incompatible with the exigencies of modern economic and social order. And so, in a cruel irony, it's in death, the quiet but ruthless devastation of lives and livelihoods by a social and economic system we have come to accept as normal, that the present book began life. For years, I'd suspected I would attempt something like this, but I know now that the present could never have been postponed had I done this sooner. Like Carlyle's depiction of his biography of Oliver Cromwell as akin to dragging out the Lord Protector from under a mountain of dead dogs, I've set out to exhume a small part of what lies buried beneath an economic era whose bitter excesses are being laid bare every minute. As I strain in the dim light of yet another power cut in an attempt to follow the thread of a story that began a long time ago, I'm struck by feuding feelings. The most vulnerable, the jobless and the destitute, have dim prospects of ever finding work, much less accessing affordable health care that has been mortgaged to overpriced private clinics and medical insurance schemes, or social security to shelter, clothe, feed, and educate their families. As I write this note to you, I feel rage and despair. As a black activist, I've given a significant part of my youth and adult life to the struggle against apartheid because, like millions of others, the opportunity to rise to the height of my dreams was blocked, trampled, and then detoured to the despairing fate of the poor. 26 years after the end of apartheid, and I'm here now, sitting in my study, trying to understand why the vision I shared with so many activists has become a nightmare of gaudy opulence and grinding poverty, of grand larceny and social exclusion, of class materialism and dispiriting alienation, and of cronyism in the allocation of economic and job opportunities. When in the early 2000s I ran a black empowerment magazine called Enterprise, I hurled implication upon implication upon the old racial oligarchy. It was a time when the elation of our democracy sagged and the great weariness of the poor began to show in deepening inequalities that seemed to fuel the polemical heat of the Tabo and Becky presidency. The basic error in my judgment, I now know, is that black economic empowerment, that hoary antidote to racial inequality, is only really a byword for plunder, self-enrichment, and elitism. The legacy of the growth at all costs market supercut. As an older generation in South Africa dies, institutional memory fades, and new mythologies become accepted verities, so much so that even the, the erstwhile black courtiers of apartheid capitalism, the B protégés who amass small fortunes prostrating themselves before the old oligarchy, entered our democracy heroes. Stripped of its rhetorical ledger domain, as we shall see, the social consequences of their uneasy courtship are today everywhere but in elite sensibilities. It is one of those sunny March mornings in 2021 when the sky is clear and the air is crisp, but not here. There's a stench from the Yuxkai River ne nearby and sulfur and dioxide from paraffin fires, uh, fired stoves. The atmosphere, like the stench, is constant. Through the smoke and haze, a jumble of disfiguring scrap tin 
wooden planks and cardboard and plastic sheets in which whole families live crowds the eye. It is the same on the embankments, where he heaps of rubbish fester in stagnant pools. Men and women walk with a slow shuffle. School children carrying satchels and books zigzag around puddles uh, with unusual urgency. Not fast, but anxiously, like a child heading out to break who's been warned not to run. To the naked eye, the sprawl is a study in monotony. Endless squalor joins endless squalor in a parade of human deprivation and environmental ruin. This is London Road, one of the main entry points to Alexandra and Johannesburg. And I'm driving with my guide, King, a Ghanaian South African, who has lived in the township for well over a decade. When I arrive in Alexandra in early March 2021 and first encounter the squatter settlement, I assume it's been there all along. One of the township's labyrinths of settled slums that have come to mark its social topography and economic status since the end of apartheid in 1994. The story told to me by King is that for many years the area covering a square kilometer was a red line between the township and the formal economy. Over the years, a handful of businesses settled there because poverty, uh, property values were low and the supply of cheap labor from the township was plentiful. Every day, men and women would gather on the embankment outside the construction and motor repair plants on one side of the road. Most were job seekers. Others were informal street vendors and hustlers. Like supplicants to the village chief, locals brought their desperation and hopes directly to the front gates of the factories. Many would gesture and try to explain why they needed to get in. On the other side stood security guards doing 24-hour shifts, keeping them out. Now something extraordinary was happening. It's a story of how the closure of the factories during the hard lockdown between March and June 2020 led to the occupation of the buildings by destitute families and of how business owners, outraged by the invasion, ordered their closure later that year. All these shacks and people are very recent arrivals, to Alex, King says to me, looking out toward the horizon. At midday, the sun is a flaming ball bouncing off the tiny shacks. They appear to invade the physical landscape as far as the eye can see before disappearing on the horizon. Above them is a tangled knot of cables drawing electricity illegally from the main grid. Along the embankment, embankment on one side, a, a wall of squat mobile toilets offers inhabitants a semblance of personal dignity. The local residents refer to the slum dwellings by the na a name that comes straight out of the Old Testament. They call it Gomorrah. In the biblical parable, divine judgment was passed on the inhabitants of Gomorrah for, the sins, for their sins, and the city was destroyed by fire and brimstone. But Alexandra is not destroyed. Like the biblical myth, the name has become a metaphor for hell on earth. It did feel like hell. In early March, the slums on London Road had that vivid, confused quality of a nightmare uh, in the blinding sunlight. Anxiety mingled with thickening despair, an existential waiting room that was, to all appurtenances, a living hell. And so it was when I visited the township in March that the name Gomorrah came to fit in an evocative way. We head about a kilometre south and King pulls up onto the embankment, rolls up his window and switches on the fan to circulate the hot stale air. He shuffles uncomfortably and then, like a sorcerer letting me in on a mystic path, he begins to relate a troubling prospect. The factory owners, he says pensively, call it an invasion of their businesses in the surrounding suburbs that lie directly in the part of the expansion of the place. People here call it survival. As I drove home that afternoon, I tried to understand what the word invasion meant in London Road. There'd never been reports of clashes between slum dwellers and business owners, or neighboring suburban residents for that matter. To the best of my knowledge, there wasn't a single report on the invasion of the factories in the area. Was a silent insurgency underway, even as violent protests sometimes flared up? Perhaps the insurgency was an organized effort, a provocation by political players to those, those who held the keys. Maybe the invasion was spontaneous, driven by desperation. Or was the term land invasion out of place in a tense atmosphere of historical inequality? As I contemplated what King had told me, it occurred to me 
to really understand the peculiar grip the pandemic has come to have over London Road is to see the word invasion with mixed perplexity. Unlike the well-dealed uh, business districts and sub suburbs nearby where shopping malls are monuments of bourgeois opulence and consp conspicuous consumption and swimming pools and tennis courts are necessities rather than luxuries, township in South Africa is a designated implementer for black peri-urban slums built during apartheid. Over the years, I had made many visits to Alexandra as a journalist, and despite its growth since I visited the place in 2001, it had never grown into official suburban status. By the early 1980s, the township had grown from a few thousand residents with transient status into permanent resident residential status granted by the apartheid government. Over time, more than a million people, many of them refugees and desperate opportunity seekers from other African countries, were crammed like battery chickens in an area of roughly eight square kilometers. Racked by poverty, Alexandra disappeared behind the squalor of a shadow economy, and everything continued to deteriorate. I was familiar with the meta-narrative of the impoverish impoverishment of rural livelihoods and the lure of the cities that pushed millions to leave rural areas, of cramped and highly contested peripheral urban spaces as rural migrants continued to arrive in large numbers, and of dire warnings from city authorities that it is in the metros that the challenge of human settlement development is the greatest. But were these grand narratives enough? What was happening in London Road, I surmised, did not fit as neatly into the official narrative arc that had been scripted for the reader. I wanted to see past the abstractions to what the invasion really meant in people's lives. Any community, wrote the novelist Annie Proulx, is a cultural landscape molded by identity, language, gender, and social conditions that bring about incremental change. Folded into observations such as these, the landscape becomes a protagonist in a, cultural, uh, a dynamic cultural practice, a social player rather than a backdrop, a verb rather than a noun, an agent rather than a symbol of power relations. Something like this was happening in London Road. The evolving landscape seemed to be molding people's lives even as they were altering it. I knew that if I wanted to understand the evolution of this urban ghetto, I would have to see the complexity in the conceptually slippery term invasion. I wanted to avoid ideological tropes and false binaries of victors, victims and heroes, villains that have tended, tended to crowd out debate of the past and present and skew interpretations of dynamic processes of change. I knew that if I wanted to, oh, sorry, my experience, my own experience as a journalist that taught me that participants in, sto in stories do not act out storylines according to a scripted narrative. Their actions are more often than not messy, irrational, and emotionally overwrought outcomes of evolving cultural, social, and political landscapes. It is a struggle of ordinary people for whom invasion has come to mean many things. What has bound people in London Road is the very thing that binds more well-heeled suburban communities. To invade is an act of claiming a home and identity. The Peruvian economist Ananda de Soto's observation that people without fixed abodes are dead capital is certainly realistic, but it also offers a somewhat ironical commentary. It is the evolution of an extra legal terrain, or what has been called the informal economy, that has had a long frontier with a legal one. A place where inhabitants of London Road have taken refuge because the cost of obeying the law has outweighed the benefit. Just as night consumes day, so with most of humanity, they seem condemned to live in what Time magazine once aptly described as the eternal present. In the eternal present, Alexandra is a deformed suburb, stunted by its social standing. Its expansion is an affront on the settled sensibilities of bourgeois suburbia. Despite government rhetoric aimed at humanizing Alexandra and providing a self-flattering version of growth and development, the township's impoverished space has been allowed only a fleeting intrusion on elite consciousness. We see people stepping outside the law because they are not allowed inside. And when the term invasion is contemplated, the question will arise whether a strong element of survival rather than illegality is not concealed in this brooding frontier. I'll stop there. Um, as I said, I prepared a longer read. 
but uh, this should be adequate. Um, I did that reading for two reasons. Um, one is I wanted to zero in on, on the South African specific context. Okay. Um, and, and as I said, the book is essentially an economic history of a global phenomenon. Um, the second is I wanted to set, in a sense, uh, both the mood and tempo for a discussion around some of the current issues facing uh, the country. Um, and I want to speak to some of those issues now, right? Uh, and then perhaps we can have a discussion afterwards. Um, I think in a broad uh, macro sense, in a macro historical sense, um, we're in something of a combustible moment. Uh, it's what Antonio Gramsci uh, called uh, an unstable uh, equilibrium. I call it an unstable disequilibrium. Uh, my, my departure point uh, is the inability in, in, in media uh, and uh, a lot of the, the kind of social conversations going on at the moment um, to theorize the present crisis uh, and situated in failed attempts by the uh, ANC-led ruling bloc to uh, systematically and ideologically disarticulate uh, the growth doctrine uh, to which I just uh, alluded to in, 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 the, in the reading from its apartheid and neoliberal origins. Okay? Um, I think it's important in this respect and an es ESCOM, which is the current kind of talk of the town, uh, is a good example. It's, it's important in this respect to distinguish the temporal aspects of the crisis okay, from uh, its more organic features uh, and historical features. Uh, in the case of ESCOM, for example, we can speak about um, uh, the, the, the internal constraints that the organization faces. We can speak about capacity problems. Uh, we can speak about the skills deficit. Uh, we can speak about uh, institutional misalignments in the organization and so on. Um, but those temporal aspects uh, need to be combined or merged with what I see as a, not just an existential crisis, but a civilizational challenge right, that we all face. Um, and in the, in the context of, of, of an energy, energy provider like ESCOM, those challenges relate to a world of finite resources, okay? uh, a world in which we need to be discussing uh, broader issues, uh, broader contemporary and historical issues related to the energy transition. So I want to suggest the failure to actually kind of theorize the crisis uh, has led to a kind of unhealthy fixation, uh, not that it isn't necessary, but an overwhelming fixation on, on, on what I see as uh, static, uh, superficial, and, and even in some cases in the media, subliminally racist uh, interpretations of factions and personalities, the ruling African National Congress. Right? Um, I think this is a good segue into the kind of framing of my thinking. Uh, I use two lenses to interpret what's going on here that I, I use in my book and I've adjusted to the South African context. The first lens is uh, what's called negative externalities and, and GDP, right? Um, understood essentially as the uh, systemic disarticulation of um, uh, the social and environmental consequences of growth, okay, from uh, our measures of growth, in this instance from GDP as a measure of growth. But this kind of exclusion also includes uh, the systematic uh, disarticulation of, of, of the social costs of growth from corporate balance sheets. This is all legal and allowed, and it's by no means a gray area. The second uh, lens that I use is, is a, a lens that I borrow from Antonio Gramsci. Um, and that, I think, relates more specifically to the South African crisis at the present moment, which is um, the notion of an organic crisis, 
um, and the notion of conjuncture, or what, what I call disarticulation. Okay, and I'll come to that just now. Um, the sense of the present crisis uh, in South Africa uh, lies in the combined impact of externalities uh, and Gramsci's distinction between um, an organic crisis and uh, the temporal aspects of, of what he calls conjuncture. Okay. Um, now, I think in terms of uh, the, the, uh, the, or the organic aspect of the crisis, uh, we need to understand that organic crises defined by Gramsci um, are a kind of compendium of incurable contradictions. That's what he called them. Okay. Um, these are systemic and structural contradictions that can't be resolved. I mean, they tend to, in a sense, have the appearance of resolution because capital is malleable and tends to move problems around. Um, and that has happened periodically in South Africa since 1994. But it predates that, and I'll come to that just now. Um, what I think in terms of these lenses we, we're experiencing, in other words, not just at ESCOM, not, in ter not just in terms of the blackouts, the, the, the uh, rolling, the rolling uh, blackouts throughout the country, but also in terms of uh, widening inequality and poverty, uh, you know, also in terms of uh, growing uh, institutional misalignments and the potential threat of institutional voids emerging. Okay, uh, institutional void, by the way, uh, meaning that uh, the kind of strain factors get to a point where we can actually begin to entertain the prospect of state failure, right? Um, uh, rising interest rates, um, you know, built on a, an unworkable monetary system in South Africa. Um, declining business consequence, uh, uh, confidence as a consequence of that. Uh, declining consumer confidence, right? And, and dire uh, uh, predictions about uh, uh, future GDP growth rates, um, not to mention employment. These are all morbid symptoms of 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 the um, of of, uh, of of what I what what I call uh, uh, a conjunctural moment that intersects with uh, what has been a longer term organic crisis in South Africa. Okay, um, on that sort of reasoning. Okay, in in the sense in which uh, I use the term organic crisis, we need to see the movement of history uh, as a series of conjunctural turning points. Um, or disarticulations, okay? And I'll speak to that now. Um, rather than look at this problem uh, as something that kind of relates to the post-94 context, I want to suggest that uh, there have been four disarticulations, five if you add one more, um, since uh, South Africa entered an organic crisis in the early 1970s, 72, 73 to be precise, right? Um, the first disarticulation was uh, the Forster government's response to the onset of the organic crisis. Um, for those of you familiar with the 70s, uh, the 70s marked the onset of mechanization in South Africa, uh, which led to a, a range of kind of structural stra strains in the economy. Uh, because of the bar on, on social mobility of black people in, in, in the economy, um, a crisis of skills set in. And so what the government did was it began to loosen up certain regulations in the economy. It was the onset of, of reforms, essentially, uh, of the first attempts to reform the apartheid system um, uh, under the impact of, of, uh, of, of, uh, of huge, huge macro and micro strains. Okay, so... For example, the color bar was floated um, and a handful of black people were allowed to enter middle management positions in, uh, in companies. Um, by the end of the 70s, uh, uh, they, they began a process of labor reforms, as draconian as they were. Uh, the first the kind of beginnings of, of, the, uh, of government's attempt to recognize some of the independent trade unions that were launched in the early 1970s. Okay. Um, 
so, you know, in a sense, it, 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 it sort of merged with, with a second disarticulation, which was uh, the rise of, of, of P.W. Bortha um, after uh, the removal of Forster. Um, Bortha's rise coincided with something that I think still marks the economic landscape in South Africa. In the United States, the Reagan administration uh, had, through the Baker Plan, begun to shift away from neo-Keynesian uh, economics okay, towards supply-side economics. It was the beginning, essentially, of what people sometimes glibly call neoliberalism today. So neoliberalism didn't, didn't start with the uh, Washington Consensus. It started with the shift to supply-side economics, basically, in the United States, driven by huge deficits that that country began to sort of incur. Okay. Um, and basically within South Africa, the, the sort of uh, the, 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 the partial disarticulation by the Bortha government from the, Forster, the 1970s Forster government was in its attempt to reform uh, the political superstructure and um, at, at a, an economic level, um, its attempt to neoliberalize the economy. So a lot of what was uh, a kind of race-based neo-Keynesian uh, economic policy uh, began to shift toward uh, uh, neoliberal policies. Um, the retreat of the state from many of its own institutions, privatization and deregulation and so on. Um, uh, within the political superstructure, we're all familiar with the tricameral system and the attempt to co-opt uh, a stratum of the black population uh, to the apartheid cause, right? Um, the third disarticulation, I want to suggest, uh, based on a confluence of factors, including uh, the collapse of, of the Soviet Union, um, the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, and huge pressures, internal pressures and contradictions inside the South African economy. Um, the third disarticulation essentially led directly to to 1994, okay, and the attempt at forging a national consensus. Um, it's what Gramsci called um, a historic block, okay. So, with all the articulations come historic blocks. Um, and here I want to clarify or, or bring some clarity to, to often confuse notions of what, what uh, the term hegemony means. It's a, it's a term that's very well used in South Africa to refer to the, the African National Congress today. Hegemony, hegemony doesn't equate dictatorship or, or variants of Bonapartism. Hegemony is essentially based, sustained, um, and, and often restored and replenished through, the, the, through, 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 through passive consent. Um, and, and it essentially is consecrated within a block of forces in a capitalist society led by business. Okay. Um, in 1994, that block was led by business. Um, it, it, uh, the ANC as a political party was hegemonic, or partially hegemonic in the government of national unity. But the block, the historic block, was led by business. At a level of policy, uh, the ANC had in mind that eventually it would be led by a fraction of black capital. Of course, that didn't emerge as quickly as it imagined. But certainly by, I think, 93, there was talk of building a patriotic bourgeoisie by, by Mbeki, some of us may recall. Okay. So instead of a rupture with the apartheid era, 94 was essentially a partial disarticulation, I, I would argue, of old apartheid formations and their reworking uh, into elements of new configurations in the South African context. Okay. The ideological expression of this was the growth, employment, and redistribution strategy. Okay. Um, it was classically neoliberal in, 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 in content and, and, and form. Okay. Uh, now, the fourth disarticulation, I want to argue, was a consequence of uh, resistance uh, on the ground and, and uh, uh, growing apathy as well. To, uh, to the Gear Doctrine. And, and here we must bear in mind that uh, it wasn't through passive consent that the ANC managed to build support 
for, for gear. And here again, I want to clarify something. Um, there's often talk, of, you know, there's often an equation of a Becky in the literature uh, with uh, uh, personality. I mean, there was a huge book written on that by Mark Kofisa. You know, I want to argue against that. I want to argue that uh, the authoritarian approach of the Mbeki era government uh, was essentially an attempt to pull the teeth out of uh, what semblance of grassroots organizations and resistance there was on the ground around that time against gear. Um, so it wasn't passive consent, but really uh, a, a kind of uh, a construction of the ANC's hegemony built on a loose historical block, uh, historic block uh, based on, on very authoritarian methods, um, top-down methods, um, and the uh, denuding of, of, of many of its own structures internally. Um, the, uh, the, the Polokwane moment has to be seen in this context. Okay? It was actually an attempt, I think, by a block of forces uh, around Jacob Zuma. Uh, a block of forces mainly in, in, in Kusatu, uh, to some extent the Communist Party and some of the social movement organizations, to restore right, uh, the kind of waning hegemony of, of the African National Congress. So here again, uh, new clarity on this. Um, you know, this wasn't about factionalism. If anything, factionalism was a byproduct right, of the Palakwani moment. <coughs> it didn't result in the Palakwani moment which is what uh, is typically argued uh, by people in, in the literature. Right? And it was an attempt ultimately to restore the ANC's hegemony, okay? uh, to restore uh, confidence in its flagging support base. Okay? Um, the final disarticulation that I want to talk about is, is the rise of, of Ramaphosa, of Cyril Ramaphosa. Um, and in many respects, uh, the Ramaphosa government can be described as a kind of muddling through uh, uh, the, 96, the, the 1996 Gear project, or what is called the class project that was foisted on South Africa. Um, and here I want to argue that uh, the, the symptoms of, 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 the, uh, of the growth doctrine um, uh, can be seen in, 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 in a flawed economic paradigm. Uh, a mishmash of this and that, uh, uh, interspersed with rhetoric by, by the Ramaphosa government, that exposes a kind of existentially barren zone. I think that the ANC currently is utterly and completely rudderless and unmoored. Okay? That's, that's the present context in which we find ourselves. Um, what I want to argue is, in a sense, that the kind of the, um, the, the failure to, to entirely disarticulate. Uh, from the preceding era characterized largely by state capture is what to some extent contributes to the, the present unstable uh, disequilibrium in South Africa. Um, uh, that disequilibrium uh, on one level, uh, at the institutional level, is, is characterized by massive inst institutional misalignments um, between macro and micro policies um, across sectors, within sectors, um, and so on, making it virtually impossible to fully comprehend um, the scale of the crisis and whether the crisis is, is moving from a, a, a kind of a, a, a level of strain to, to a level of failure. Okay? Um, the, the prospects that lie ahead, um, you know, based on, 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 on this reality, uh, require that the ANC transcend some of the kind of contradictions, uh, the class contradictions, the social contradictions, um, and, 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 and adjust to a new uh, uh, economic doctrine um, that allows it to um, come to terms with the economic imperatives of the day. Okay? Uh, and, and, and that would, to some extent, allow uh, a new program, a new policy uh, uh, program to form the material basis for a more sustainable hegemony. Um, I don't see that going on right now. I, I think that the uh, crisis the ANC faces is a crisis of legitimacy. 
it can no longer rely on the kind of historical entreaties to uh, the so-called National Democratic Revolution, uh, which I see as a, a, a kind of a false abstraction. Uh, it can certainly not rely any longer on policies okay, um, that have the support of, 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 of its support base, of the poor in particular. So it faces a waning constituency, um, and it faces growing uh, voter, voter apathy, um, right? It could go one of two ways. Um, either it temporarily defers the crisis, kicks the can down the road in a sense, right? Um, uh, and, and forges a new historic block. Or uh, it shifts to the right, okay? And uh, it shifts to the right under the impact of growing kind of resistance and, and protest um, uh, led by social movements on the ground. I think it has two choices, okay? It either reconstitutes a historic block around a new growth path entirely, okay? Or it, and, 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 and it seems to be moving in this direction, it doesn't move at all and um, under the impact of, of factionalism within its own ranks, it enforces its authority, right? Um, it shifts toward more coercive uh, measures uh, to, 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 uh, to sustain its hegemony. Um, what, what then are some of the options in front of us? Uh, what, what's to be done? Um, I think it's important to, to realize here that, that uh, you know, there isn't a, a kind of uh, a menu of, of solutions uh, that that, um, that that we can we can we can rely on. At best, uh, you know, we can interpret the current crisis and acknowledge that the current crisis has very profound uh, structural limits. Okay, um, that if we try to find solutions within those structural limits, then as I said earlier, we're simply looking at deferring the crisis and restoring the ANC's hegemony uh, around a, a very tenuous historic block, if it's capable of actually constructing that block, right? Um, what's the theoretical premise of, of uh, some of my postulations around, around potential solutions? Um, I think that as an alternative, uh, we can begin to kind of entertain the notion that the traditional um, uh, neoclassical economic equation on which we rely currently um, that saving equals investment uh, is, is problematic. So I want to kick that out and suggest that um, that first and foremost mm -hmm. is, is the problem we need to acknowledge. According to Keynes, just to, you know, to Keynes, to, to John Maynard Keynes, just to, to clarify, um, capital that lies idle um, that doesn't invest, uh, doesn't create employment. So uh, capital that's invested, in other words, you know, what, what Keynes argued is that uh, the notion of, of savings to GDP and, and the idea that the greater the ratio, the greater the rate of great, uh, growth, the greater the distributive of dividend is false, right? Um, uh, Counter-cyclical spending essentially means that um, the more money you invest in spite of deficits that you might incur, uh, the greater the potential for uh, employment creation. Okay? Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that these things automatically occur in the current growth paradigm. Um, what few people know, and I've misread in Keynesian economics, um, is that the kind of Keynesian economics that emerged after 1942 wasn't Keynesianism that Keynes himself imagined. Okay? The one thing that got kicked out in 1942 um, was the, the social costs and the environmental costs of growth. Uh, that got kicked out and at a, um, a very important conference that happened in the United States around that time, Keynes lost the battle against uh, some of his opponents, his more liberal opponents in, in the US administration, economists around that time. He died, um, uh, I think, a decade after that. But the point is that 
what became known as neo-Keynesianism is certainly not what Keynes himself imagined. Okay, so you know when I speak about Keynesianism, um, I sp you know I, I'd like to issue a caveat. I, I don't speak about Keynesianism in the sense in which a lot of people uh, understand it. I speak about Keynesianism. Uh, as an economic doc doctrine that internalizes, doesn't externalize the social and environmental costs of growth. So, so that's an important point to make, right? Um, I think at a macro level, what's certainly needed is, 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 is a, uh, a renegotiation of the relationship between growth, um, GDP growth, and, and livelihoods, right? Um, so, that's, those, those are some kind of broad macro perimeters, in a sense. Um, drilling down, I think that uh, the perimeters need to be revisited, okay? Um, and consistent with the kind of my departure point, I think the, the perimeters around investment um, uh, at a micro level need to be revisited. Uh, currently, the investment perimeters sit squarely in, in, in the prevailing uh, growth at all costs doctrine. Okay? Um, in other words, they don't take into account um, environmental and social issues. Okay? Um, so I think at a sectoral level what's important is, is that uh, we need to renegotiate the kind of measures that we use uh, for investment. Uh, and some of those measures, I would suggest, uh, ought to include uh, employment multipliers and economic spillovers, importantly. Um, uh, you know, in engaging the success of, of, uh, of, of new incentives that we might introduce in order to, to bring in investment. I think the second point at, at, at that level is that um, we need to identify um, industries that uh, have compound impacts on the outcomes that we desire. Um, and if those impacts relate to a new growth tra tra uh, trajectory that, that uh, has at, at, at its center uh, social and environmental concerns, then I think that uh, uh, education is important. Uh, that's from schooling through to tertiary education is important as an investment and not within the current paradigm of privatized schooling and privatized uh, 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 some privatized tertiary education institutions. Um, I think the second uh, 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 targeted sector within the perimeters that I've sketched is public housing. Okay. Uh, I think the, the other is, is public health care, critical. These, by the way, are, are sectors that are critical to the creation of a, a productive and healthy um, society. Okay. Um, uh, within a, a sustainable ecosystem um, uh, in the economy. I think the other is subsidized food, and that relates to the entire value chain from agriculture to food production. Okay? Of course, energy is, is critical. Okay? Um, and here we need to, in a sense, uh, look at, at what some people are calling um, a new energy transition. Uh, uh, toward renewables, okay, so that's critical. And then I think a cross-cutting perimeter is infrastructure, and I don't see that as a sector in itself. I see that as uh, an intervention that all sectors, of all of the industries that I've identified require. Okay, so I think that, you know, with those, in, uh, those, those industries, those targeted industries in mind, um, we we need, we need to look at investment uh, uh, or the notion of, of investment through a different lens based on uh, entirely different perimeters. Uh, we need to move away from the logic that um, uh, uh, sorting out our deficit is going to be a panacea. We need to move away from the illogic that um, uh, getting uh, more savings uh, onto our balance sheets, uh, national ledger is going to be a panacea. Um, we need to consider in this respect that it's a tiny, very tiny fraction of the population within the middle classes that save. Okay? Um, the working classes and the poor uh, 
can't afford to save. Uh, capital doesn't save, it invests. Okay? So essentially what you have is an absurd situation where there's an obsession with savings and bringing down the budget deficit, um, reliant on, on a shrinking middle class. Okay? Um, those savings are then bundled into pools of capital and then invested in a paddling pool uh, of listed, uh, listed stocks. Okay? Uh, the returns on average to not the institutional investors but individuals themselves is about 3%. Okay. Um, the beneficiaries are, are largely the fund managers and institutional investors themselves. So, you know, why are we obsessing with, 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 uh, with saving, you know, um, which, is, which is based essentially on supply-side economics? I want to kind of go back to Keynes before 1942 and argue that part of the solution lies in a kind of shift toward uh, a less revisionist and more, you know, uh, original uh, Keynesian doctrine based on um, uh, the vision of a well-being economy. Ultimately, I think in the South African context, um, a new historic block has to be built. There's no doubt about that. The kind of volatility that we're experiencing right now at the level of the political superstructure and the economic base is unsustainable. What we don't want is we don't want to shift to the right toward a uh, Bonapartist kind of... Uh, uh, methods of, of, or styles of government. Uh, we certainly can't uh, afford a reversion to the status quo. That's unsustainable. Um, what we need is, is a historic block built on a new growth paradigm entirely um, as a basis for uh, new adjustments to the economic imperatives of the day. Uh, I want to stop there and just, you know, uh, you can ask me questions or uh, make comments. in this country. 
you know, and we're talking about it as a historic block, and I agree with that. But you know, where's, where's it going to come from? How, how do we actually catalyze that? Mm. Yeah, I think uh, those are good points. I think in one sense, um, the kind of shift toward developmental speak and, and um, welfareism is, is actually a direct consequence of gear itself. So, you know, um, it, it actually yeah, necessitated that in, yeah, in order to sustain passive consent. You yeah. know, um, that's what it was. So using the lens that I've sketched over here, um, it's not just peculiar to South Africa, by the way. In other countries where you've had similar growth trajectories, you know, um, uh, you'd find that um, the more neoliberal the economic policy, the greater the welfare spend. Right? We heard this um, uh, in, in Cyril Ramaphosa's State of the Nation address this year. Uh, two emphases, uh, rhetoric aside, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, the, the one was uh, a massive emphasis on black economic empowerment what he called deepening it, right? Um, and then the other was, in a context of a rising budget deficit, right? Interestingly, uh, the call was for greater investment to bring down the budget deficit, not in order to resolve issues in the economy, but to ramp up the social welfare budget. Now, I mean, how absurd can that be? You know, where, where is the economic logic in that? Um, you know, you're not confronting the cause of the problem, you're looking at the symptoms acknowledging that there's a problem, you know, um, but not addressing the cause. And I mean, I, th I think that, that applied to, um, it applied to the United States uh, at various moments uh, as much as it does to South Africa, although the complexity in South Africa is a great deal more nuanced uh, than, than in the United States. I mean, I recall the periods in, in the 40s when um, this major debate happened between the Keynesians and the uh, the liberals, uh, led by led, the liberals, led by Simon Kuznets, and um, the kind of arguments turned on, on very similar, very similar things. Um, Kuznets felt that he lost the battle. His whole thing was that uh, welfareism ought to be a massive concern. Okay, um, for the neo Keynesians that had emerged, the neo Keynesians around that time. It, it was about counter-cyclical spending. That was the emphasis. But as I said in, in my talk, uh, minus the social environmental costs. So you can have your welfare budget uh, to ameliorate the condition of the poor, okay? And to sustain their passive consent and sustain the hegemony of the Republican or the Democratic Party or whatever. Um, just as long as you kick out uh, those costs uh, from the national ledger and from corporate balance sheets. And I think we're sitting there now, right now. And I think unless we kind of come to terms with the, um, the macro, massive macro flaws, it requires a paradigm shift in a serious way. You know. um, we're going to be having discussions about, uh, which is the kind of uh, the thing going on in the media at the moment, about, uh, and, and they aren't untrue, but the reality is that they need to be located properly and they need to be situated in context. We're going to be obsessing with things like skills, um, capacity, and so on and so forth, without seeing the bigger picture. So you can resolve those problems, for example. You can bring in more external people um, to help out ESCOM. Let's assume hypothetically that you actually sort the problem out, ultimately. You get your skill set right. Um, the question that you need to ask yourself is, how sustainable is that in the context of a systemic and ide ideological crisis? Right? It's not sustainable. Um, you know, so yeah, I, 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 thanks for that. I, uh, I like it and I found it interesting that you were actually there in Treasury. So that's, um, yeah, I, I would imagine. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a question from our online audience, uh, Sian Latakan from Ithaca, New York. Uh, how does your proposal differ from the RDP that was proposed immediately after the end of apartheid? Do you think some kind of large-scale redistribution program is possible? 
Yeah, we, we need to, I'm not entirely sure what, remember there were versions of the RDP, there were different iterations of it. And, and there's often confusion about that because I, when I look at the RDP, I look at the original, um, not, not the shifts that occurred afterwards, the base document. And, and, you know. um, in fact, interestingly, uh, Oscar, you, you probably know him, uh, the economist, recently did a, um, uh, he, was, he was involved in the Merg group, okay, which uh, ultimately uh, uh, came up with the RDP. Um, so if we're looking at the original RDP document, uh, not some of the adjustments that were made afterwards, um, I'm entirely in support of it. Um, it is based on counter-cyclical spending. Um, it, it has a strong element of, of, uh, of redistribution built into it. You know. um, it has certain limits in the sense that it doesn't go so far as to look at the growth at all cost doctrine in the way that I do. I mean, what I'm arguing is that ultimately what we need to be considering, entertaining in our discussions, in our policy discussions and public debates, um, is where the growth should be put first in the first place, right? And with the RDP, it was about um, uh, uh, growth through redistribution. Okay, Gear, of course, did the opposite, right? Um, in that sense, I align myself with the RDP, but I want to argue that growth in the way in which we understand it, measured by GDP, needs to be decentered entirely, right? Um, therein lies the problem. I want to come back to the externalities thing. If it's measured according, uh, using GDP as your metric, it doesn't matter what you put first. It doesn't matter that you put redistribution first as your primary objective. Right. Um, is it going to be workable within a, 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 a GDP framework, a GDP growth framework? That's part of the problem. And I think that's the thing that got lost in the 40s when GDP was born. Um, and that's been a legacy ever since. You know? So I support the RDP and the RDP's emphasis on redistribution, but with uh, an additional rider and that rider is that we need to kind of decenter the GDP from, from uh, our sensibilities and assumptions about growth itself. Um, to some extent, it falls within you know, what some people globally call the degrowth kind of doctrine. But I'm not saying that I'm not a supporter of an advocate of growth. Growth is necessary. Right? Uh, I'm not idealistic in that sense. You know, I'm arguing that growth is necessary. It's measures what's problematic. Very said, excellent, thank you. <laughs> okay, pleasure. And then I think on that point, I just want to know how do you locate this kind of fixation on GDP as a metric or GDP per capita as a metric? How does it become so widely accepted as like um, the metric for progress or for solving social uh, issues? Like when did we move from solving social issues with such economic metrics? It's a good question. Um, thanks for that. Um, I don't think GDP was invented to solve, to solve social issues. I, mean, I just want to start there. So that's, that's a starting point. Uh, GDP emerged, believe it or not, in the context of, uh, well, an economy in the United States that wasn't defined, and neither was it defined in the UK during the build up to the war, the Second World War. Um, so it was an attempt by Simon Kuznets and a group of um, economists in the United States to define the American economy. Um, now what's interesting is the shift to Keynesian economics occurred prior to the invention of GDP itself. What, what was called in, in, in the United States gross national product became gross domestic product, but we know there's a distinction technically between the two today. Um, but the shift to Keynesianism in a very simple uh, way, which, which then kind of, in a sense, uh, grafted GDP onto growth, right, was really an attempt by uh, the Roosevelt administration to fund uh, the costs of war, uh, what became, or what is now known as the military-industrial complex, right. Uh, the collateral consequences of that was in the design of GDP in 1942 and then 1945 when it was officially adopted. Right. which, as I said, excluded the social, social and environmental costs of growth. Um, its legacy um, since then as a complex 
uh, evolution. Okay. Um, what had happened is, is immediately after the war, it was Europe that was the centerpiece, the focal point of the United States. What the US needed was it needed new markets. Okay, because remember, the war economy enabled, firstly, the US entered the war economy belatedly. So it didn't face the kind of body blows uh, on its infrastructure and its economy that Europe did. Um, secondly, uh, individual households in the United States, in particular within the middle class, amassed massive savings because nobody was spending during the war. Right? So there were giant pools of capital uh, uh, you know, that, that the institutional investors were sitting with and the banks were sitting with, of household money. Right? The US was looking for somewhere to invest that money. And Europe potentially was a stable market. So GDP became the kind of stabilizing force through the Marshall Plan. Okay? Again, I mean, all these things are actually correctives because the assumptions of what, the assumption about what the Marshall Plan is, often incorrect in history. Okay, the Marshall Plan was actually, was, was a, it wasn't an attempt to stabilize Europe, uh, to bring prosperity to, to economies that were decimated by, by the war, but rather to uh, arm the U.S. with export markets. Right? Um, once that plan had fulfilled its mission in, in Europe, it was to Africa that the United States ad adjusted the doctrine, the framework, the Marshall Plan, essentially. Uh, to the African context. So often there's a, there's a sort of equation of colonialism with imperialism. But imperialism actually only emerged, de facto emerged, um, as a force uh, within the United States uh, from, from 1950 onward. And that was with the kind of redirection uh, using the framework, the Marshall Plan framework, of its attention to the African context. Right? Um, driven partly granted by political factors and ideological factors. In other words, the concern by the United States that the retreating colonial powers from Africa created voids you know, in, in a Cold War ideological battle you know, that uh, positioned African economies potentially uh, on a knife edge. You could go either way, either east or west. So, you know, I deal with this substantially in the book in, in a chapter, that, uh, two chapters in the Cultural Cold War. You know, so at the level of ideology, there was that. But more fundamentally, um, this, these markets opened up. These, these new markets uh, in Africa opened up. Um, uh, they were largely uh, markets in the extractive sectors. And uh, GDP was a disciplining whip. Does it make sense? It was a disciplining whip, in a sense, before the IMF emerged on the scene fully fledged. Um, IMF conduited these things through schemes that emerged uh, uh, without calling or labeling it structural adjustment in the 70s. It was that de facto, and then became structural adjustment with the shift to supply side economics from 1982 uh, onward with the Baker Plan in the United States. I could spend hours talking to you about this, but I'll stop there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, read, read the book. Yeah, read, read the book. <laughs> do, you, do you think that if you want to change the world, you should buy a thousand copies of the book and give them to groups of people to study together? And so from there, you glean your, your, your heads, you know, your brains, your brain's trust that you were looking for. They can get through the book. And they you know, I, I, first of all, I would take completely opposing view. And I would say, you know what? Train an army of development workers in this. Mm. Yeah? Yes. By all means, equip them with the intellectual framework. Mm. And, you know, the what that Malcolm has written about and has talked about, and that's very important. Mm. But the money that has just been washed away in this country because it's just been put into the hands of people, A, who don't care, B, who are not held to account, and it's in the name of trying, you know, I mean, the, the very fact that we still talk about beneficiaries, government institutions talk about development programs and people on the ground as beneficiaries, I mean, 
that is just such a demeaning, mm -hmm. patronizing term. You know, how dare we speak about our fellow countrymen as beneficiaries? Yeah, we should be speaking about partners mm -hmm. that we are working with. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, that's, that's the paradigm mm -hmm. that should exist in the country. We haven't even begun to make that shift at a, at, you know, at a very high level in the country. I think what both of you are, are, are talking about is what you initially were alluding to, and that is uh, the call for a new activism. I think that's the debate that we need to be having, actually, um, and w what that means um, in, in, in the country, uh, not, just this, not just South Africa, but actually in the world today. Um, well, some of us who come from activist traditions, like myself, uh, we know that historically it was patterned in a certain way. It was organized politics. It was strongly, fiercely ideological. Uh, it was vanguardist, you know, um, and so on. Um, that doesn't apply anymore. And the issues in one sense have also changed. They've shifted um, quite dramatically. Um, the players or potential players, uh, you know, in, in what we call activism also hugely different. Um, Social media has altered our, our kind of sensibilities about what activism means also. I today see my literature as a form of activism, for example. How we take that, break it up, and then make it kind of accessible to people is something that Kwan, sitting over here, and I are busy with in an initiative called um, the Ghetto Advi- uh, the, oh, not the Ghetto, Jesus. <laughs> the Rebel Advisor. Uh, although it might as well be the Ghetto Advisor. But, um, you know, so it, it's, 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 it's how do you take the sort of ideas in the book um, and then uh, translate it into activism, into, into new forms of activism across the board, you know, uh, recognizing that uh, you're not going to change society by seizing state power. That, that's not going to happen, right? I also spoke about the notion of a historic block, you know, so seizure of state power doesn't resolve those questions. Um, if anything, it may well replace one Bonapartist regime with another, which is unsustainable. Uh, so, you know, um, it, it, it really calls for a, a new discourse. Um, um, and I don't think that it's a single one. It's, it's multiple ones that so happen in multiple spaces. Uh, with regards to you know, the whole RDP and, and uh, you know, redistribution of wealth and all of this, uh, you know, South Africans have this notion, uh, or I feel that, you know, the elites have all this money and they should just redistribute it to the poor because that's what we need to do, in a sense, if that makes sense. But redistributing wealth or, or giving handouts to people doesn't actually empower them and it keeps them as these beneficiaries where they, they, they are, are demeaned, mm -hmm. in a sense. So, like you're saying, we, we have to start looking at, at, at a different approach as opposed to you know, driving past them and, and stopping on the side of the road there and, and giving the guy a five rand or a ten rand. We've got to somehow shift the, the focus in, in empowering them uh, to an extent, if that makes sense. And you know, what, what I do from a, a, in terms of my business, I've come from a financial advisory background and I've been so disillusioned with all of what goes on in the financial sector because if you're not in the financial sector, uh, you, you don't benefit from it. And if you're a client for, of, of any one of these asset managers, uh, like Malcolm's pointed out, you could be invested on, on the stock exchange in the, top 20, in the top 20 funds, which if you look at what they do, you're getting a 12, 13% return per annum, but when you actually get your return, you're getting three, four, five percent and that's because all of these other uh, layers are, are built in that strip out uh, the capital that gets put into these institutions and, and, and these huge institutions because they are corporates get favorable tax rates and they, they then also get a, a leniency from, from policy and from government and that, uh, it, it really keeps the individual in a slave almost uh, in, in a box in a sense. And so uh, you know, one of the things that we were, uh, we were discussing as well with regards to what one of the solutions could be is to, to look at a, 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 almost like what we termed, what Malcolm termed, a, a sovereign wealth fund uh, of sorts. and, and you know, we're fleshing that out, but from my, uh, from the, the, the fantasy that I have in my head with that is that we, we, we go back to the traditional way of how communities actually helped one another out. Mm -hmm. and, and we stopped relying on big corporate or government to, to kind of give us a handout to, to say, well, this is what we're going to do to help you out. 
mm. and really start to begin empowering people on a ground level where we, we start off and, and rebellions, uh, revolutions, all of that starts off in small little rooms like this. I mean, that's what happened in Fordsburg. Mm. You know, I, I come from the melting pot there where, uh, you know, um, my mom's a poor white South African, my dad was an immigrant Chinese. And they kind of, you know, they were charged with the Immorality Act. You know, mm. They had their house taken away. Um, I, was, I was registered as zero zero being white, and my brother and sister were zero four being non-white Asians uh, on, our, on our birth certificates. Mm. You know, and, and that leads to a whole bunch of confusion. So, we, you know, we, we get dictated to by government, by corporate, by all these big entities as to how and what we should do and what's the right thing to do, saving and that's uh, just today, I was listening to um, the Alexander Forbes talk about uh, how important it is to save and invest. Uh, and, and the statistics still show that only 6% of South Africans are going to be able to afford to retire comfortably. I started my financial advisory career 20 years ago, and those are the same stats. And over 20 years, mm -hmm. the financial services sector has done bugger all to empower people. Mm -hmm. We're still sitting at only 6% of our population are able to retire. Mm -hmm. They fail to tell you that that 6% of the people that are able to retire are actually people not reliant on the financial services sector mm -hmm. in terms of taking out policies or investments or this or that. It's, you know, that 6% actually have various income streams built up through empowering initiatives, owning their own businesses and all of that, where mm -hmm. you know, the media keeps saying, invest, invest. Companies are now, and, and a couple of uh, investment companies who are saying, you know, times are tough, markets are bad, put your money with us, and in five years we will double your money. There's no actual um, physical asset that they link it to. It's all based on structured notes. It's a promissory note. It says, I'm a big company, I've got a shitload of money, and uh, if you give me more of your money, uh, if things are okay, we're going to give you double your money back in five years' time. That's a 12 point. 85% return per annum, uh, which is great. But the reality is it's only ever paid out two or three times out of the, they, they launch the fund, or they launch a new tranche every four months. So three, in, three injections a year times by five, that's 15 capital injections so that they can pay a double up if the markets are growing. It's basically a legalized Ponzi scheme that's been run by corporates and, and the financial services sector and, and government it, uh, it, it allows it because you know taxes get paid to it. Yeah. So I mean, I, I, I told Malcolm I, I, I was reading this book and I actually had to stop for a while because I got so depressed mm -hmm. with, with what's actually going on, you know. And the only thing that we can do is, you know, from my perspective, is you know, from a, from a grounds up level. How do you change the world? A smart man can't change the world. Mm -hmm. you know, a smart man realizes in order to change the world, you have to start by changing yourself. Start by changing the way you see the world. And I think this is what this book is showing us. It's giving us a different lens with in which to see the world, exactly. And, and it, it, uh, I think Malcolm said something earlier. He said it's a, it's a different history, but it's not a different history. It's a history that hasn't been told. Mm -hmm. I think the parallel. Yeah, the parallel is definitely, yeah. So I just, <coughs> I'm finished. <laughs> I just, you're sort of touching on that. Um, it seems in the global context, um, the narrative very much seems to be like the, the collapse of the old power structures and renegotiation between um, these, these two like binaristic extremes, um, the right and the left and, and the east and the west. Um, and I just, you know, as, a, as an activist, and a, a journalist and, uh, and, and, a, and a writer, um, I, I, I'd just be very curious um, to hear you talk about how that, um, that, that, that binary and things become more and more polarized in discourse all over the world, how you see that kind of manifesting in an African context. Um, and also, I think, in all this chaos, you know, I feel like a lot of people are realizing that, you know, the more people are, are paying attention to how uncertain the world is, the easier it is to 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 walk away with large amounts of money that doesn't technically belong to you, you know, um, and you know how people can like fight back against that, um, like you know, 
I, I was, you know, really, really compelled by your, your, your framing of like historical blocks, you know? And I feel like historical blocks are sort of um, defined by, you know, how, how, how the, 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 the people in the block um, respond and react to, to, to challenges and factors and stuff which are specific there. And I think, like, especially like in South Africa and in Africa in general, there's so many like inspiring examples of um, people forced to respond to horrible things going on in the world um, and finding human ways to deal with that, you know? Uh, it's probably a terrible example, but um, I went uh, to a high school next to the high school of like one of the biggest, most prestigious Afrikaans uh, schools um, called Helpmakar. And it's like it's weird because Halpuka is like very much a, a symbol of Afri African elitism now, but it started as an organization um, which was like coordinating community groups to help kind of widows and, and victims of the South African War, um, and that and like stock fells and you know all of these like practices of people coming together, putting their finances together, and, and doing interesting things with it. Mm, there's a lot there. Um, yeah, yes, I, I, th I think for starters there is a great deal of polarity going on, but um, it's being, in a sense, obfuscated uh, by... I, 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 I'd spoken at, a, at a, um, a book festival at Kingsmead not so long ago, and there was a, uh, a person from the United Nations present there, development program, program present there, who, who works, who does, does a great deal of good work. Um, in, in the, um, the, the informal economy space in the African context. But she raised an interesting question which uh, kind of uh, confused me initially. You know, she, she, she raised the question of what they see. When I say they, I mean the multilateral institutions. Um, what they see as a drift toward a, a kind of uh, post-Washington consensus, global uh, consensus or social contract implying that uh, on the one hand um, there's a need for it because of polarity on the other hand suggesting that there actually is some kind of drift toward um, consensus now the notion of a historic block is uh, the the same thing as as a consensus whether that consensus is national regional or global okay so you can uh, you can sort of extend that lens as wide as you as you need to the logic still the internal logic of it is still there um, I don't think that there's a drift toward a consensus I would agree with you if that's what you're implying that there's a great deal of polarity going on how that's playing out in the African context is complex um, I try to stay away from party politics and in terms of my analysis because it's just nonsense and it yeah. makes no sense that perhaps, you know it's unscientific and it makes no sense whatsoever um, but if you were to look at it in, t in terms of class strata, mm. then you've got an interesting discussion potentially going on. Because in the same way that we've got this uh, reconfiguration going on in South Africa, mm. um, where class configurations are far more complex than they were historically, yeah. uh, you've got a shrinking working class, which by the way is, is one of the reasons that the ANC is vulnerable, because that was its agency mm. historically. The agency was there, and it was institutionalized through Kusatu, mm. you know, this pre-apartheid, I mean, uh, uh, pre-94. Pre um, so it, 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 you, have a, you, you have a greater, a larger growing number of, of people who sit in what's, you know, kind of broad, uh, uh, broadly called the precariat. Mm. I think the precariat as a class of individuals is what more appropriately defines the African context, mm. right? Within that precariat, uh, the glut of people are poor and ghettoized. So 80% of Africa is informal, right? On the other hand, you've got greater concentrations of wealth. And then I can speak with authority there that you've got greater concentrations of wealth. So you've got emerging very tiny elites uh, that at times situate themselves in oligarchies, at other times are elites within the private sector. Um, the historical legacy of, of the GOAT doctrine in the African context has been tendencies toward oligarchy, mm -hmm. where you've got this kind of, this merger of state and private sector. Mm 
Um, you've got uh, the dispensation of, of, of uh, largesse, you know, to to uh, uh, to individuals and so on. Um, so they were almost tied uh, or hemmed in at the hip with with ruling parties because of the uh, of the access to the state, state resources and so on. We see that in South Africa too, right? Um, so you've got, Piketty was right, not in his current book, Inequality, but in his previous book, um, uh, Capital in the 21st Century, when he argued and took a long-range view on data uh, and argued that what we're witnessing is, is rising concentrations of wealth and, and, and inequality. Um, three of the uh, more recent reports by Oxfam demonstrate that very clearly. That, that the gap is widening. Mm -hmm. So in, in the African context, you don't, it's inequality that poverty is obviously always, it's always been the problem. Mm -hmm. And it's pervasive or as pervasive as it's always been. But the, the real issue is the extent to which the polarity is happening between uh, a rising precariat on the one side and then greater concentrations of wealth within tiny elites on the other side. Um, is there, are there national consensus happening? No, not at all. So the UN is wrong on that front, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in terms of the assumptions that they're making about, about social compacts, and mm -hmm. national consensus. Incidentally, I think that a lot, a lot of the terminology uh, and then some of the interpretation that emerges from terminology is problematic. Mm -hmm. And my book tries to tackle all of that. Mm -hmm. I mean, the notion of a social contract and national consensus, for example, mm -hmm. is completely debased in terms of like kind of a lot of the interpretations what that means and the way it's fallaciously kind of you know yeah. Yeah. Uh, adapted to uh, to suit uh, uh, arguments and ideological agendas yeah. Yeah. and it doesn't take into consideration the very complex and very real realities of you know Africa and with the legacy of colonialism like, um, even this this idea of like a national identity is so complicated because you know unlike in Europe we, we aren't countries kind of formulated around you know, ethnic groups or languages or, or, or ideologies, uh, we, we, we were kind of like imposed, our borders were imposed on us, which is why you have so much kind of like um, inter-ethnic um, you know, group, um, inter-population um, uh, conflict throughout the, the, the continent. Um, and it, it feels like that kind of stuff, you know, isn't really taken into account by, by, by international kind of narratives of, of the, the situation here. No, absolutely, it's, it's not. And I mean, those narratives apply largely, really, I mean, let's call a spade a spade. They apply to the multinational institutions, mm. uh, multilateral institutions, mm. sorry. Uh, less so in terms of foreign policy mm. of, of governments. And we know how muddled and kind of uh, tempered those, mm. those policy statements often are, right? But they relate to how the multilateral institutions that were largely born as post as Bretton Woods and then post Bretton Woods institutions, the way those architectures continue to shape uh, the mischief and, and the kind of hidden agendas mm -hmm. of these institutions and how they're playing out. You know, I mean, no offence to some of the good work that some of the institutions are doing. Um, you know, I've, mm -hmm. I I think that um, the 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 good is is is, is outweighed by the hidden agendas. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. Uh, Malcolm, are you happy to take that as your last question? I think it could be your one more. Okay. Um, <coughs> for me, this has all been like very uh, profound and just it's hit me hard. Uh, and I've always been thinking about uh, just this topic on unity uh, in the world and everything. So just that you know what everybody said and uh, the ideas and topics that you also talk about in your book. Um, if, for example, all of these were um, propagated more, um, vocalized more, even by even, uh, people with more prominent voices and such, um, could this perhaps like result in a form of unity in the world and even in South Africa? Uh, from your perspective, do you think that could like, result in that? So it could what result in more unity? Uh, like if we raise this, like how the activism of this and the topics that you raised and everything, you know, touch, the topics that everyone touched based on as well was mm. like raised more via social media, television, mm. propaganda, newspapers, everything. Mm. Would that perhaps lead to like unity in the world? 
with people, God mm. with everything. Because I wasn't thinking about what can lead to unity. You know, well, that's always something that I was thought about. So once you discuss it, I was just thinking, could this possibly be the answer to that? Yeah. Um, well, you know, in a sense, uh, what was raised over there about polarization uh, to some extent speaks to what you're saying. Um, you know, ultimately, you can only build, uh, well, there's no, firstly, let me just say at the outset, that there's, no, there's no absolute unity. I mean, you know, you, know uh, you can idealize the world, but the world that you want. But, uh, uh, you know, you can't idealize it. There's, there's, uh, there's beyond national, national, nationalism, there's, there's, you know, there's, there's, there's group cultural identities and so on, which, you know, one must embrace, right? I mean, it's not, it's not a matter of kicking them out. Um, it becomes a problem when it becomes a form of cultural relativism, right? Um, you know, and those kind of right-wing notions of, of cultural identity, that it's sort of problematic. But I think that for unity in a, in a broad generic sense to occur, um, you know, requires uh, an unraveling of the Bretton Woods architecture, uh, policy and institutional architecture to start with, right? which is part of the problem, okay? Um, and then if we want to go further back, maybe we need to look at the, the, the problem also residing in the Treaty of Westphalia in the 1600s, you know, and, and the kind of uh, formalization and institutionalization of the notion of a nation state, right? And then, of course, in Africa, the way in which those large powers and the nation state consecrated in Europe, not in, in developing economies of the world, but the way in which that concept was foisted, you know, onto the African continent um, uh, uh, centuries later, right? Um, the material basis for an, uh, an enduring unity is what's important. The social for, for the social basis of, of, of uh, a more abiding unity is what's is what's needed. And I think the starting point there, without idealizing it, is that. Uh, the post Bretton Woods architecture, firstly, must be dismantled. And then, secondly, um, the ideas uh, that populated activist movements uh, pre 19 or two, uh, pre 1991, 1989, need to be adjusted or, or abandoned. I mean, they no longer apply. You know, um, and what's good in some of the kind of ideas, Gramsci's one, for example, you know, Polansis, there are other people, you know, who were ahead of their times, right? Uh, who now suddenly, I think, in my opinion, make more sense, right? Need to be brought back into our understandings of what's going on and the potential to build a kind of global consensus around issues. And I think the important thing over here is that it's always a, a, a matter of re constantly reworking um, ideas uh, into evolving systems, you know. Um, uh, you know, bear in mind we live in a global economy today that isn't as static as it was pre-1989. You know, um, you have a couple of variables that make the challenge of uh, unity and disunity, you know, um, possible. Um, You've got technolog uh, technological enablers, you know, um, that are major disruptors today, that were not the disruptors in, in the pre-89 uh, era. You've got the rise of social movements on the back of that, that have the potential for greater unity, but also have the potential to, to, create, to create more disunity. Um, you know, you've got, for example, you've had the drift post-1990s toward uh, greater globalization, but you've also had reactions to that by the left, right? Um, uh, and you've had the rise of anarcho-capitalist movements on the right, you know. Um, you've had the threat to, to, to state sovereignty and the erosion of the power of the state and a pullback, a right-wing pullback in Europe and so on, um, all suggesting greater unity and disunity. So I see it as a kind of dialectic, right? <laughs> a sort of dialectical interplay between the two. Um, I want to kind of just, you know, maybe sum up what you getting at uh, with this? There are no absolutes, you know. Um, that's a critique. The book, um, and it offers something of a new lens through which to see a future, right? 
but it doesn't imply that there's some kind of end state, and, and you know, and that we, we get to a point uh, where there's a, a sort of nirvana, and and it ends there. You know, I mean, I think that was the failure, one of the failures of Marxism, you know, um, or not the one of the major failures of Marxism, uh, as appealing as some of the, some, of the, some of the economics of Marxism still is. Um, mm. That's where it got it wrong. You know. um, the, the world doesn't end with, with some ideological nirvana. And we, we suddenly don't wake up tomorrow morning, uh, you know, and we're all in some kind of zombified uh, state of, of, uh, of harmony, a permanent harmony. Um, so it, 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 I see the world as a complex kind of uh, system of moving parts. Um, and and uh, that require constant adaptation, adjustment, you know. So these historic blocks constantly need to be renewed, uh, you know, uh, and that requires work, right? What I do think is possible and, and desirable is uh, is is that the state in its current form, right, in in, in its current form. Um, isn't desirable, right? Um, I'm, I need to distinguish between the state and regulation here. Yeah. Regulation is, you know. At what level we, we, we institutionalize these things is the big debate, you know. Um, is it done universally? Uh, Ella Stiglitz and that argument about Joseph Stiglitz, about having some form of global govern, uh, uh, governance, um, um, you know, do we do it super supranationally? You know, through regional blocks. Uh, I'm skeptical, but I'm just saying that the state, at a micro level, um, in terms of its current configuration, certainly in developing country contexts, where uh, the kind of boundaries of the state understood as a condensation of forces uh, and, and a kind of collective or an organizer of, of the broader, the wider collective. Um, that those, those geo geopolitical configurations remain utterly and completely redundant, arbitrary, uh, and senseless, you know. Um, but I have a good question, um, and perhaps somebody should write a book on that. I mean, uh, it's, 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 it's... What about a 22 million rand flag? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask you to just tie it up and, and, and contextualize your book in two minutes, but I think we've kind of done that in the last question, so I just want to say thank you. Uh, I, I suppose you take some more questions afterwards if there's people run around, but uh, yeah, thank you very much. If you could just have a nice round of applause for Malcolm X. Thanks for coming. Appreciate it.